To make, again, a long story short, um, the coordination between that blood and that image constituted by the particles of his body, the, the uh, very um, um, uh, coordination of it is, is uncannily similar, almost identical to the gospel narratives described, I mean, to the to the a unique crucifixion of Jesus described in the gospel narratives. Explain. Walk us through that. Okay. So here's the, the main thing. Remember now, blood first. That's what you'd expect. Then image second. The radiation comes second from the low temperature nuclear reaction. Okay. So you're going to have a boom and a light too. I'll just uh, say that mm. as well. But let's go through the crucifixion evidence first. Uh, so first, let's just take the crown of thorns. We have only one known crucifixion in the entire history of crucifixions. Only one man was um, uh, uh, crucified with a crown of thorns. Mm. And that was Jesus, because Jesus was accused of calling himself king of the Jews. Makes sense for him. Didn't make sense for anybody else. But the man in that shroud definitely was crucified with a crown of thorns. And not only that, but the, thr- the thorn that was used in the crown is called uh, what and now is called a Syrian Christ thorn, a very long curved thorn that embeds itself not only in the side but on the top of the head, causing a a considerable uh, pain and emitting uh, multiple uh, uh, wounds uh, that actually penetrate into the nerves um, in the skull and the uh, flesh that's surrounding the skull. Uh, Terribly painful. But a Syrian Christ thorn, just saying, like the pollen grains, comes from that region of northern Judea Mm. and Jerusalem. Second thing is, you can see between the fifth and the sixth ribs, you can see a wound. Uh, Of course, the the, uh, Gospels describe that a spear was thrust into Jesus' side and out flowed blood and water. Remember John's gospel. Mm. And he's so defensive about it. He says, this is seen by witness and his witness is true. So of course he's insisting, I saw not just blood, I saw water fly uh, coming out of it. Now, of course, this is a unique event. Again, we don't have spear wounds in crucifixion, um, uh, in the history of crucifixion, because that would have put a guy out of his misery sooner. But remember, Jesus is already dead. The Passover was approaching. They just wanted to do it as a check. They weren't putting him out of his misery. They never would have done it, and they never did it in the history of Christianity. And when you say they wanted to do it as a check, it's because, in part, they didn't want him to accidentally be somehow rescued. Yep. Alive, and exactly. then this thing they were trying to squash, quash Christianity yeah. would bubble up even more fiercely because yeah. oh, he's resurrected now. You're right on the marker, and um, mm-hmm. and not only that, but now the shroud really shows this is exactly what happened. You can actually see the spear wound. It's an elliptical spear wound, just like the ones that were used uh, by the legionnaires in in Rome. It goes between the fifth and the sixth rib up at a 30-degree angle into the thoracic cavity, nicks the heart, and then keeps on going up to the pulmonary uh, 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 cavity. And there, remember, the pulmonary cavity is filling up with a transparent fluid, kind of looks like water, but it's filling up because the man has to lift himself up in order to breathe. Mm. So now this, the pulmonary cavity is filled with the water. It, it hits the pulmonary cavity, but when it nicked the heart, the blood from the heart squirts out. And then the pulmonary fluid looks transparent like water, squirts out right afterward. And if you look at that wound, that's exactly what happened. You see the blood in the center. You see the pulmonary, the pleural fluid surrounding it right between the fifth and sixth ribs where the spear wound obviously was. I mean, anatomically, it is perfect. And we have, you know, Buckner, 
Um, you know, and uh, oh, it started with Barbat, who identified it. Then, of course, uh, Buckner, and then um, uh, um, uh, a series like Zugabi and a series of other uh, uh, histopathologists have examined this over and over and over again. No question about it. Outflowed blood and a transparent fluid, just like the Gospels say. Then the third um, thing that we see is the whipping, the flagellation um, that, that uh, took place. Now, in this case, we can tell right away, uh, Jesus has, um, you know, the th- he's whipped 39 times, but um, in with the uh, um, whips, the Roman whips, see the, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, medieval whips only had one strand, but the Roman whips had three strands, And they, you know, maybe about two and a half feet long, and they had little lead dumbbells at the end. And those dumbbells would grip onto the side of the man being whipped. And then when they pulled it out, they would pull it out so that it would shred the flesh along the man's neck or back or shoulders or thighs or whatever was getting whipped. Now, there was a guy to the right of Jesus and a guy to the left of Jesus. The guy to the right's a little taller than the guy on the left, but they are whipping away um, on him. And so he's left with all of these shredding of the flesh wounds from this whipping, and he is losing major blood. Uh, You can see that, and you can see that this blood loss is going to explain why Jesus died so quickly. Normally, crucifixions could last not only an entire day, but could actually last for two entire days or more, you know, where the person is just uh, suffering in, in agony until finally he cannot lift himself to breathe anymore and endure the torture. But in Jesus' case, he was dead after three hours, uh, according to the scriptures. And that would make sense. There's a tremendous amount of blood loss there. And by the way, this is a Roman whip. This is not a medieval whip, uh, something that was invented by a forge. We, we didn't have, um, you know, it's called a flagrum. Uh, we, we had no evidence of a flagrum until we discovered, you know, it at Pompeii and, and other uh, archaeological sites. But the main thing that's important here is the whip is Roman. And so uh, the elliptical head on the spear is Roman. So it's coming from this area where a forger would have never had opportunity uh, to get the facts right. Then we start uh, looking at other things. Um, For example, we can see that there is a slope um, to the man's right shoulder. And on that shoulder, it's an 11 degree slope going uh, downward, uh, meaning uh, his shoulder was dislocated. And so We can see in the middle of that slope shoulder a very large contusion there. And uh, so uh, we can also see on the man's knees that there are scrapes. So it looks like the man, obviously, he's carrying a very heavy blunt object on his shoulder. He somehow trips. He lurches forward. And then when he lurches forward, he smashes his knees onto the ground. This heavy object goes up in the air and blam, it smashes his shoulder, dislocating his shoulder, causing the contusion in the middle. Then his head just snaps to the left and pulls his right eye into the right eye orbit. These are all of the things we would expect to find in um, an accident like this or in a fall like this. And of course, that's exactly what we see on the shroud. Again, the man is tormented. This also explains why they get Simon of Cyrene out on the deal, right? Because um, uh, they got to have somebody carry him, uh, I mean, carry the cross. He can't do it. He's going to be partially paralyzed on his right side. So there's just no way he's going to be able to carry that cross any further. So they got to get some. The Romans didn't get Simon of Cyrene because they felt sorry for Jesus. Romans didn't feel sorry for anybody. The basic thing is they want to torment him as much as possible, but Jesus couldn't do the job. So they basically get this guy from the fields. Then you look at the piercing in the hands. I mean, this is really amazing. We only can see the exit wound on the right hand. So we can see, for example, the angle that 
um, you know, the nail came out of. And it looks like it's right about here on the wrist. So uh, essentially, when you um, uh, look at that, uh, uh, Pierre Barbet, who first examined it, thought that they must have put the nail right through the wrist itself instead of through the palm. But in point of fact, that's, um, Zugabi found out later, that is not looking at the angle of the exit wound, right? That's not the likely scenario. The likely scenario is that the nail is put right in here at the lower part of the palm. And this is what we call the thenar furrow right here. And there's a little channel that goes down here in the thenar furrow. So the, the nail gets put in and the nail follows this track of the thenar furrow and comes right out there, exactly at the angle of the exit wound that we see in Jesus, in the man's hand. So that, again, pretty much looks like um, this is Jesus um, by the nail prints, but also we can see to the uh, the amount of pain, because there's a complex of nerves uh, right here uh, that, you know, it's unimaginable. Remember, man has to lift himself up to breathe. Well, gosh, it's just like pressing against this complex of nerves, which is shocking him and shocking him. And by the way, this guy was not nailed to a little, you know, ledge on the cross that's coming out, right? It, it, it's His foot is literally nailed to the wood of the cross. So, I mean, he's There's no platform is what flat, you're saying. Exactly. So it, there's it, no way to... And, and when you talk about breathing, for those happily unfamiliar with yeah. crucifixion, which, you know, in the modern era, we largely are, yeah. but they're, the idea that they can't breathe, they're suffocating because they're hanging. Explain yeah. that to people. Yeah. That part of the torture of crucifixion. Yeah. So when you're hanging there, right, mm -hmm. uh, the main thing to remember is your diaphragm is fully distended. Mm. Well, it's fully distended. You're not going to be able to breathe. Only thing you can do is lift yourself up. You've got to pull yourself up. Ripping against your own flesh. Ripping against your flesh, going through those nerves. And even the nail ones, they're right through a set of nerves in the ankles, right, and going through the heels so that he is experiencing shock after shock as he's trying to pull himself up. And so, um, essentially, the man is being tormented for hours and hours and hours. Well, suffice to say um, that this is none other than Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. His crucifixion is unique. It's all Roman weaponry that's being used. I mean, the anatomical precision between the blood and the uh, image itself is perfect, even though the blood went first and the image went second. I mean, I have not a single doubt, um, you know, that the body that lay in that tomb was crucified in exactly the way described in the gospel narratives so that the gospel narrative validate the shroud and the shroud validates the gospel narratives. Mm -hmm. No question in my mind about it. What a perfect parallel. I can't imagine anything else explaining it except the exact gospel account.